Let's pick up with a quick review of what we covered about area under a curve. So if we want to compute the area under a curve, what we're going to do is we're going to first start by approximating that area with rectangles. Now, the way in which we can build those rectangles um, to estimate the area can be done by using either right-hand endpoints of a subinterval, left-hand endpoints of a subinterval. Actually, any point on the interval, we just tend to go with right-hand endpoints, left-hand endpoints, or midpoints. So we talked about the right and the left on the last video, and I want to just clarify some notation that was introduced and review some notation. So if we say use R sub N, R sub N is going to be an estimate of the area under, and we're going to say y equals f of x, whatever the function is that we're looking at, using n rectangles where heights are computed from the right-hand endpoints. That's thus the capital R, right-hand end points of the subintervals. Let me shrink that down a little because that got quite large and off the screen. Okay. So R sub n is an estimate of the area of f of x using n rectangles. So if it was R sub 4, then we would use four rectangles. And we would build our rectangles using the right-hand endpoints of the subintervals. So we're going to use right-hand endpoints. So in this particular picture, if I was given a curve that looks like this, y equals f of x, and asked to find R, I'm going to do R4 for the visual, uh, four rectangles, then I would build my rectangles using the right-hand endpoints for the heights of my rectangles. So I'd go on each interval, I'd go to the rightmost endpoint, and I'd use that to build to build my rectangles, and then I'd have an estimate. We could also use the left-hand endpoint, so I'm going to switch to blue and talk about that. So L sub n is an estimate of area under y equals f of x using n rectangles where the heights in this case, the L, is telling us to use the left-hand endpoints. Are computed from left hand endpoints of the sub intervals. Now you're going to have n sub intervals. So in this case, oh, and you know what? I didn't write that up here. So let's go ahead and write the one. The one that we did up here was actually, this was an an illustration of r sub 4. So on, I took actually the same exact curve. I just copied it. This is y equals f of x again. We could also estimate the area using L4. And if we used L4, then on each of the subintervals, and I didn't quite line this one up, we could use the left-hand endpoints to create the rectangle. So then on each sub-interval, what I would do, and I'm going to do these in um, blue, like we've written here for L4, what I would do is I would use, so on the first interval here, from A to this point, we could call that X1, from this point to that point, I would build my rectangle by using the left-hand endpoint to find the height. So the height, the first rectangle would look like that, the second rectangle, again, using the left-hand endpoint of the subinterval to give me my height and doing that all the way across through, well, all the way across. There's actually only four intervals here, but that would be a representation for this curve of what L sub 4 is. Four rectangles used to estimate the area under the curve of y equals f of x. And there is one last one, and we hadn't had a chance to talk about this on the last video, 
Um, but there is a, one other, well, not one other. There's actually an infinite number of ways to build your rectangles because you could literally pick an infinite number of different points along each subinterval. But the three that are most commonly used are the left-hand endpoints, the right-hand endpoints, and the third one, which we're going to define right now, m sub n. And m sub n, when we write m sub n, that's an estimate of the area under y equals f of x using n rectangles where the heights are the midpoints. The heights are computed using the midpoints of the subinterval. So the heights are computed from the midpoints of the subintervals. So for the midpoints, if we're going to use the midpoints of the subintervals, again, let's do M4, just like we did R4 and L4. If we did M4, and I'm doing it in orange-ish yellow, I guess, here, if we had four divisions, M4 would say use the midpoints of each interval to determine the height of your rectangles. And an area using M4 would, of the same little curve that we have, would look something like that, where we use the midpoints to grab the heights of each of those rectangles. So we have R4, L4, and M4. So that the, the capital letter is telling us which endpoint to use, right, left, or midpoint. And then the N is telling us how many rectangles to use to do an estimate. Now, I will say this, and after we do an example, we're going to explore the idea of letting this N go to infinity, right? Because as we let N go to infinity, this actual estimate of an area that we're doing will become an exact area. And it turns out if we let N go to infinity, the width of the subintervals actually goes to zero. So as N goes to infinity, the width of the subintervals goes to zero, which makes it such that it doesn't matter which point we used to create the heights of our rectangles. We could use left, we could use right, we could use midpoint, we could use, you know, this is not one that we tend to use, but we could use like a third of the way over. We could use like the third points or something, a th one third of the way across the interval, use that point to create your height. It doesn't matter because as this little width in here, I'll highlight it, as this little width in here of each of these intervals goes to zero, and that's what's going to happen as n increases and goes to infinity, as those go to zero, the left and the right and the midpoint just approach each other until essentially we're looking at rectangles with no width. They're infinitely thin little rectangles to give us that exact area. Okay, so before we go into that, before we let n go to infinity, let's actually do a couple of examples where we are estimating some areas. So if we had a curve, let's maybe make that just a little bit bigger. If we had a curve like this function right here, y equals f of x, and we were asked to use um, six rectangles, n equals six, to find estimates for the area from zero to 12. So if we're going to use six rectangles, first thing we would want to think about is what is the width of each of our rectangles? So what is our delta x? Delta x represents the width of each rectangle. And we're going to get into whether we're going to build the heights from the left, the right, or the midpoint. And in this case, we have all three here, left, right, midpoint. Um, but the width is going to be the same regardless of where we're building our heights. So the width of each rectangle is going to be the length of the interval, which since we have a is 0 and b is 12, it's going to be b minus a over n, which is going to be 12 minus 0 over 6. So delta x, and, and this is one maybe we don't need to actually, right, we could probably have figured out if we have six rectangles and a length of 12 that the width of each one of them is going to be 2, 2 units for the widths of our rectangles. But it's worth actually writing um, that process down, that b minus a over n, because pretty soon we're going to, again, not have 6, but have n, right? We're going to let the number of divisions be n rather than a specific finite number, 6. Okay, so delta x, that's the width of each rectangle, is going to be 2 
and on our graph right here, that means that we're going to be making divisions at 2, I'm going to rewrite 4, 6, 8, 10, and of course 12, and we have 0. So those are each, on each of those, so those are each of our subintervals listed out, we're going to be computing some areas. Now these are going to be estimates, we're going to be pulling them from the graph, but we can get as close as we can. So let's do, to start with, and I've been using blue, so I'm going to go back to my blue here, let's do L6. Um, I'm going to write L6 over here, and then we'll go ahead and do the computation. So L6, if I were to draw it, what L6 is going to look like, we're using the left-hand endpoints, L sub 6. So we're going to build a rectangle using the left-hand endpoints. And then we're going to have another left-hand endpoint. And then another left-hand endpoint. And another left-hand endpoint. And moving all the way across and so now I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna speed up the video I'm going to be doing estimates from the actual graph and these are estimates I don't have a function if I had a function here if I knew that this was um, y equals I'm just gonna make something up here real quick uh, 64 minus x squared if I knew that then I could plug in my left hand endpoint 0 2 4 6 8 and 10 to find exactly what those heights of those rectangles are but I don't so I'm just gonna use estimates to find the heights so I'm gonna be estimating the heights here from the graph so estimate heights from the graph. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to um, pause the video, and I'm just going to fill this in to find out what each of our heights are. So what I did here was I just used the graph to approximate those areas of those six rectangles. So you can see on each one of these, uh, the first one using the left-hand endpoint, the height of the function was nine and the width of the rectangle was two. You can see the widths are two all the way throughout. I left them here so that we could really see that each of these is an area of a rectangle. This was rectangle one. So here's rectangle one, two, and so forth. So this was rectangle one. Here's rectangle two rectangle three and so forth okay so you can really see um, height times width height times width height times width but noticing that of course the width is the same for all of them so we could have even factored that two out and written that as two times f zero plus f of two plus f of four plus dot 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 Okay. So I just want to mention that we could have factored out that too if that makes uh, the calculations just a little bit easier. Um, then I estimated from the graph and you can see the those products right there and the area again it's an approximation but the area is approximately equal to the estimate using left-hand endpoints and six rectangles of 81.3. Now this is I guess we could write units squared. We are talking about um, actual area so these are units squared in this case okay all right let's go ahead and do the same for r6 and m6 and again i'm gonna um i'm gonna go ahead and speed up the video and you can see the drawing of both of those and the computation of both of those Okay, so 
what I did there was as I sped that video up um, and you could watch that a little bit in um, fast forward, I guess, um, is I just drew each of the different sets of rectangles. We'd already talked about the left hand endpoints, the ones I drew in blue. And then in red, I drew the rectangles that would estimate six rectangles that would estimate this area using the right hand endpoints to calculate the heights of the rectangles. And then in yellowish orange here, I did the midpoint. So using the midpoint. So here on each of the little sub intervals, grabbing the midpoint, which is at 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, using those points to calculate um, the heights or to, to set up the heights of each of the rectangles. Then using the graph just to estimate, and these are approximations. Um, obviously, I had to make some estimations um, educated estimations off of where the graph was. And you can see each of these um, particular graphs. Now, if we were to go back, we would also be able to talk about whether our right-hand endpoints were over or under estimates. And I no longer have those on the graph because I erased them to draw in the midpoints. But our left hand for each of, I will actually just draw maybe one rectangle of each. For this particular function, because this function is actually a decreasing function, when we go and we draw our rectangles using right-hand endpoints, as we use the right-hand endpoints, let's do the red right-hand endpoints first. When I draw in the right-hand endpoints, each time I draw in a right-hand endpoint and then pull back across the interval to create my rectangle, notice that my rectangles, because this particular function is decreasing always on this interval from 0 to 12. So notice that since that function is decreasing, this r sub 6, this is actually an under estimate of the area. Each of the rectangles is under each of the rectangles is being built under the curve, which means that when we use them to estimate the area under the curve, that we're getting an underestimate. And on the other side of that, if we were to be using the left-hand endpoints, so on the intervals, on each of the intervals when I'm drawing the rectangles, I'm starting on the left-hand side and drawing across my horizontal line to create my rectangle. Each of those, since the function is decreasing, is actually above each rectangle's height is above the rest of the function on that interval, which creates an overestimate. So it turns out in this particular case that this is actually an overestimate of the area. It overestimates the area. Now the midpoints are, we don't know. We're not sure what's happening with the midpoints. I, I've already erased the midpoints, but the midpoints, the, those rectangles span across the function, um, some of the functions above and some of the functions below the tops of those rectangles. So we can't really say if the midpoint is an over or an under estimate. Um, and so, you know, which would be the best? Maybe the midpoint. Maybe the midpoint's giving us the best estimate. Okay, so maybe we say the midpoint because we know that this is an overestimate, that's an underestimate, and the midpoint might be somewhere in between, might be a good estimate. So now let's generalize what we've talked about and what we've done. Let's generalize this idea of finding area under a curve. So if we want to find area under a curve, and let's let that curve be y equals f of x, and let's let f of x be continuous on this closed interval from A to B. If I want to find area, and I'm calling it just capital A here, so I want to find this area under this curve, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, just like we did when we estimated it, I'm going to divide up the interval into subintervals. So here's the process. We're going to divide A to B into subintervals. Into N sub intervals of width we're going to call it generically delta x delta x is going to have to be if there's n sub intervals it's going to have to be the length of the interval which is just b minus a divided by n so delta x has to be b minus a over n then that's going to create n sub intervals so each sub interval on A to B can be labeled as X sub I minus one to X sub I. 
So for instance, this starts at zero, x sub a is actually, or a is x sub zero, and then we have x1, and then we have x2, dot, 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 till we get all the way out here. This guy is x sub n minus one, and the last point, x sub n, is the end point, is b, okay? So this is for i equals zero, one, two, all the way to n. On each of those intervals, we can pick a tag. And what, is, what does this word tag mean? So we're going to pick a tag, and we're going to call it x sub i star. So pick a tag on the subinterval. On each, I should say, not just the, on each subinterval. So x sub i star is an element of the subintervals. And I know this is a lot of notation, but this is actually exactly what we've been doing on the last couple of examples. Um, when we've had a specific number of rectangles, we've used four and we've used six. When we've had a specific number of rectangles, we have actually done this exact same thing. These tags tend to be our right-hand endpoints, left-hand endpoints, or midpoints. But they can actually be anything. So that's why we generically said just pick a tag. So note, I'll make a little note here, the tags, this idea of a tag, x sub i star, can be and is often, actually, we often do pick it to be the right-hand endpoint, the left-hand endpoint, or the midpoint, can be right left, right or left endpoints or midpoints or anything or left end points. It can be right or left endpoints or midpoints. It can be anything. It tends to be one of those uh, like we've already looked at, but it can truthfully be anything. And so why is that? I'll just draw a little picture real quick and then we'll erase it. Like So if here's x sub i minus 1 and x sub i, Obviously, that's the right endpoint. That's the left endpoint. Um, the midpoint would be right in here. We could call it x sub i bar. We often use a little bar when we talk about the average or the middle. So it could be x sub i bar. That would be the midpoint. And what happens is, and I can't really, sh I can't really uh, shrink this um, or show you shrinking this with my fingers. But basically what happens is this length, this delta x is going to go to zero. So as we get those closer and closer and closer and closer together, as the left and the right hand endpoint move closer and closer together, as these move closer and closer together and the midpoint gets smushed in the middle, this gets so, so tiny. We end up looking at intervals that are like this where they're just all those points, the left, the right, and the midpoint are just on top of each other. They're essentially the exact same values. That's why it doesn't matter. That's why we just say pick a tag, right? We're just like, it's kind of generic, like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. Pick a tag. doesn't matter if you're building your rectangles with your right-hand endpoints, your left-hand endpoints, or your midpoints, because as we shrink the width of the interval down smaller and smaller and smaller, those points all approach each other. So it doesn't matter what we pick as our tag. Okay. So I want to just make a quick note of that because it can seem kind of arbitrary, like, well, why aren't we being specific? Why aren't we picking a specific um, tag, a left endpoint or a right endpoint? And that's because uh, ultimately it's not going to matter because we're going to let delta x get uh, infinitely small. Okay. We're going to let the width of our rectangles get very, very small to make this an exact equality for finding the area. Okay, so we pick a tag and then we compute the area of the rectangles. And then we add up the area of n rectangles approximating the area under the curve. So it doesn't matter. We're going to use our tag to find the heights of those rectangles, and then we're going to add them all up. So the area is going to be approximately the area of n rectangles. So it's the sum of n rectangles. Well, what does the sum of n rectangles look like? Well, let's write it out. It looks like a bunch of widths times heights. So the area is going to be approximately 
f of x sub 1 star times delta x plus f of x sub 2 star times delta x. Remember, each of these is representing a height of a rectangle times a width, and the width of all the rectangles is exactly the same. So you will see that delta x on each of these areas. So this is the height times the width, height of the, and this is of rectangle 1. And then x sub, um, x sub 2 star times delta x plus f of x sub 3 star times delta x plus, and we go all the way till we get to the end, and we get f of x sub the nth interval star times delta x. Now, notice that that all has a delta x in it, so we can pull out the delta x, and then we're adding up the sum of f of x sub 1 star plus f of x sub 2 star plus dot 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 plus f of x sub n star because the delta x was in each of those. So this is approximately what the area is equal to. Well, this piece right here is a sum. And in fact, we like to write it in its summation notation. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to say that this is the sum from i equals 1 to n, because we're adding up n rectangles, f of x sub i star times delta x. And notice that is just a nice way to say that we're adding up n rectangles, each with a height of f of x sub i star and a width of delta x. Okay? So that's just a really nice way to say that. Then the last piece, because again, this throughout all of this, we've had this approximation symbol. This is an approximation, right? I mean, n could be four, it could be six, it could be 10, it could be 100, it could be 1,000, but it's still an approximation of that area. If we're using rectangles, it is still an approximation of that area until we let the number of rectangles go to infinity so that we are essentially just adding up infinitely thin rectangles, each of, um, each of height f of x sub i star. So now what we do, and this is sort of the crux, the calculus part of it, because all of that actually has just been geometry. So here is the key. I will make it like a, let's make it a sparkly star. Okay, sparkly star here for our last step. Then we're going to let the number of rectangles increase without bound. So let n go to infinity. And what that means is that the number of rectangles whose areas we're computing is going to grow without bound. So number of rectangles grows without bound. What that does is that gives me the area, we've been saying area, now I'm going to specify it's the area under y equals f of x on the closed interval from A to B is actually going to be equal to, notice I'm no longer going to use my approximation, I'm going to use my equal sign. It's the equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. Here's how we let n go to infinity. We have to use a limit. We let n go to infinity and take a limit of this sum. i equals 1 to n f of x sub i star times delta x. And that is how we can compute the area under a curve. And this is not an approximation. We can approximate it if we let n be finite, and that's what we have to practice doing first. Um, just like we did on the graphical example above, but then we can let the number of rectangles go to infinity, and this becomes not an approximation, but an exact area, okay? All right, and that does give us a definition. That gives us the definition here that I have, and I will project if you wanna write this definition down. Um, That will give us this definition right here. The area, a of some region S that lies under the graph of a continuous function is the limit of the sum of the areas of the approximating rectangles. Notice here on this first one, I actually used R sub n, the right-hand endpoints, but this is more important, and this is where I want to highlight. This is a more important result here, that it doesn't have to be the right-hand endpoints, like I mentioned in that little sidebar um, in our 
explanation of this definition, that does not have to be the right-hand endpoints. It can be X sub I star. Okay, and that is what that is going to be what we're going to use more often than the right-hand endpoints. Okay, so go ahead, pause the video and take that down. Um, the highlighted is a little more important than the, the two above. The two above are specific to right-hand endpoints. Um, and we could do, we could actually come up with two more um, estimations using left hand and midpoints, uh, where essentially what would happen is this would change just a little bit. It would be x sub i minus one for the left hand endpoints and x sub i bar for the midpoints. But more specifically, this last result that the area is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of all of those areas of rectangles, regardless of what the tag is, x sub i star being your tag. So if we want to set up an expression to represent the area under this curve from 0 to 1, so what we just defined was the fact that area is actually equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i star times delta x. So we know what our function is. What we need to figure out is what our x sub i star should be in the context and what our delta x should be in the context. So that's what we need to figure out. So let's start with delta x. Remembering that delta x equals the width of our subintervals. So if delta x is the width of our subintervals and we need n subintervals and our interval is from 0 to 1, we're going to have 1 minus 0 divided by n. So whatever n is, my subintervals, my width of my subintervals is going to be 1 over n. So for instance, if n was 4, then I would take my interval from 0, which is my a value, to 1. So from a to b, I would divide that up into one in, uh, subintervals of length 1 fourth, 1 over 4. But it's 1 over n. So if it's 1 over n and we start at a, the first interval, because each of these is going to be a width of 1 over n, the first point here, x1, x2, dot, 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 till we get to x sub i minus 1 and x sub i and all the way out to x sub n, which is at 1. Each of these is 1 over n. So x sub 1 is going to be 1 over n. And then we add another 1 over n. Each of these is with 1 over n. So this would be 2 over n. This next one, x sub 3, would be 3 over n, and so forth. In fact, x sub i is going to be i over n. And x sub i minus 1 is going to be i minus 1 over n. So it turns out that our subintervals which are each x sub i minus 1 x sub i are going to actually be i minus 1 over n and i over n. We could write them that way. Okay? So that's what each of the subintervals is like. Now, the other little piece that was told here to us was to use our right-hand endpoints to set this up. Well, if we're going to use the right-hand endpoints of each interval, the right-hand endpoints are the rightmost point in the interval, so i over n. And so x sub i star, the tag that we want to use, remember that represents the tag, and we were told to use the right endpoints. So if we're going to use the right endpoints as our tag, the right endpoints, x sub i star, is going to simply be x sub i, which we've already defined and shown has to be i over n. Okay? So if we are on, um, you know, because you really have to envision i being very high, right? Like you have to envision um, the number of intervals, you have to, you have to envis envision n going to infinity. So if n goes to infinity, then you have to look at an infinite number of intervals. So i can be very high, like a thousand. So that's why we're kind of trying to come up with a generic way to represent this. If we're um, looking at the thousandth interval, what would that look like? Well, it would be a thousand over, say we divided um, by a million, it would be a thousand over one million. That would be the tag on that interval. Okay, so that is our tag. And now all we have left to do, where was our function? Our function itself is x sine of pi x. So now all we have to do is actually plug everything in. So our area 
if I can get this all on the screen at the same time so we have space. So our area, the expression that would represent our area is actually going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n. Now it's f of x sub i, which we are actually going to plug in i over n, times delta x, but delta x is 1 over n. Okay, So this is actually the limit as n goes to infinity from i equals 1 to n of f of i over n times 1 over n. But remember that f of x was the sign, hmm, I think it was x, yes, x sine of pi x. So f of x, just because it's not on the screen, I'm going to write it over here, x sine of pi x so that we have it. So that was our function that we're looking at. So our area is actually equal to the limit. Now we can substitute i over n into our function. i equals 1 to n of i over n times the sine of i over n times 1 over n. And there we have our expression for the area. We could simplify that a little bit. I guess we could write that as n squared. We could write that as i over n squared times the sine of i over n. Notice one little simplification that we could add in there. And that's an exact, right, that's an equality. Notice, like, I'm not having to use approximation. When we take that limit, that becomes an exact equality for the area. That's exactly what the area is going to be equal to. Okay. Now, I'm not going to, because, again, the video has gotten a little long, I'm not, and we did, we've already done some estimations. So I'm not going to do an estimation. If we were wanting to actually do these estimations, then we would do five rectangles, right? We would divide up the width. Rather than if we've got five, we're going to divide up the, the width from zero to one. One, two, three, four, five little subintervals. Each of them is of width one fifth. So it's two fifths, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, and one, which is five fifths. And then we use those endpoints to come up with um, areas of rectangles. So we add five areas of rectangles. Again, um, I'll just give the idea on that. Add the five areas of the rectangles using either right-hand endpoints, left-hand endpoints, or midpoints to compute the heights of each rectangle. You don't even need a graph for this because you actually have the function. So for the heights, you can just plug those endpoints into the function or midpoints into the function. Okay, let's go ahead and end just leaving this final definition on the screen uh, because this is an important, very important definition for us. So that gives us the area under a curve, that limit of that sum of areas gives us that area under a curve, the exact um, value of the area under a curve.